Thank you. Thank you. I can get the impression that a lot of people think that this is a pretty important topic, and in a few slides you will see how other people in journalism think of it as an important topic. Uh, it's about cloud centralization. The word cloud is in quotes because Richard Stallman has complained a lot about the use of this term. He's pointed out the term is very vague and it really obscures what's happening, which means that your data and your calculations are on somebody else's computer. And I'm going to, well, I'm going to use the word cloud freely because it's familiar, everybody knows it, it's easy to use, it brings up easy, easy associations. So the outline of the talk um, I should also mention that I usually like to have a dialogue with the audience, but that's hard to arrange because we're taping it and the microphone's down here. So I'm just going to run through the slides. I hope I don't bore you, and it'll take about 30 minutes, and then we should hopefully have some time for some real discussion. A description of the problem, and I think most people have a pretty good idea of what this problem is, and then uh, I'll keep that fairly short so I can get to the stuff that was in the description of the talk in the brochure, the three technical drivers, and hopefully the most interesting part is the possible remedies. So let's start with the problem description. Uh, it's all over the place. Here's the most recent uh, wired issue. Uh, they have something called the Mirror World. Their executive editor, the ex original founding editor, Kevin Kelly, wrote this article about how devices everywhere are going to record everything we do and it's all going to be available in a big cloud. Um, here's the... I also have the links down here and I'm sure the slides will go up eventually. So you can eventually get the slides and get the links. New York Times, uh, The Guardian. If you want to talk to the author of that article, you can probably find him. He's Tim Berners-Lee, probably a few blocks from here. We have the Atlantic Monthly complaining and the Harvard Business Review. And finally, to show how current the issue is, we have the uh, uh, suggestion by Elizabeth Warren that we break up the big companies. I'm not endorsing the Warren campaign or this particular proposal. I'm just showing that this is a very hot issue right now. So when we look at it, I'll first say a few nice things. That's what Dale Carnegie always told you to do. So the cloud has some good things about it. There are a lot of great computing things that it offers, uh, things that people couldn't get otherwise, that they can get through this centralized system. And so there's a lot of creativity. You can go on YouTube and see people doing amazing things and allowing themselves to be exploited. Then we have uh, the advances like weather forecasting and smart cities. Uh, I'm sure you could say more. <clears throat> but there are problems. And I want to distinguish some of the different types of problems because I don't want to talk much about some of the problems. A lot of the things that the press talks about, uh, the politicians talk about, are really a problem of monopolization, which economists have covered a lot. And these are things like vendor lock-in, regulatory capture. A lot of people said that the Obama administration was too tight with Google, for instance. Lower wages, reduced innovation, which is an interesting topic. I'd like to talk about some other time, whether there is reduced innovation. And if not, what's different about software that makes it different from other monopolies? So those are things that are more general. It's not part of this talk. Another thing that's not part of this talk are the specific problems of social media. They are certainly problems of centralized computing, but it's one vertical sector in social uh, in centralized computing. So they cheapen relationships. Like nobody puts online the fight they had with their kids. It's always happy families on vacation. And by the way, these things are not certain either. Some researchers say these aren't true. So I'm just saying these are the complaints. They degrade information, fake news. The kind of incendiary stuff like that video from the horrible massacre in New Zealand, and then the fear that your employer or the government will go back to something that you posted in high school and punish you. But these are not part of the talk. So what is part of the talk? There are still a lot of problems left we're going to discuss. This is going to be a pretty busy slide when we get to the bottom. So the central problem is that they collect data. And you can imagine offering a service without collecting data, but it's just too tempting. And I'll go into why a little bit later in the talk, but there's just too much you can do with data. But they always say, they start out saying, it's doing it to improve our service. And you can't really complain because you want a better service, but then it sort of goes and goes, and it's hard to draw the line to the point where it's privacy uh, invasive. <clears throat> 
And besides invading your own privacy, they're also making judgments about communities, whether it's well-identified communities like ethnicity or it's communities that they make up by all their clustering algorithms. And so it can lead to some kind of discrimination. It reduces transparency. The algorithm tends to be a black box. Um, and also, if you're not online, then uh, you're not counted. A lot of people in lower income communities use cash, for instance. They don't use their credit card. And so they just aren't considered. And that might be good and it might be bad. Um, and then asymmetric knowledge. This is when you go online for an airline ticket and you don't know why you're getting that price. Uh, you don't know that you're being manipulated. And this gets really important with the famous issues of the Brexit campaign and the vote in 2016. So we have to ask, what is free will when we're being manipulated this way? Uh, it can create a vicious cycle. Once they get a lot of central computers and a lot of data, they can do more and more and they can buy up their competitors or put them out of business. And finally, it creates a central point of attack, a point of failure uh, when a whole data center goes down or a point of attack, whether for an individual intruder or for a government that demands the data. So that is my list of problems. You might come up with others. I will finish with this little quote. A society of large tools cannot be democratic, egalitarian, socialistic, humane, and just. It must be hierarchical, exploitative, bureaucratic, and authoritarian. If the day comes when all of humanity's wants can be supplied by a few giant tools, the people who tend them will rule the world. And that comes from the Whole Earth Catalog. I think uh, from 1974 to now, it's still pretty relevant, and I guess that's why Wired brought it back. So now for the part that I put in the brochure, the three drivers of centralization. Um, there, once again, I'm going to set a scope to this talk, because there's certain things about the cloud that you can hear from the vendors themselves and from the trade press, and I don't want to go into the much. Scalability, lower administrative cost, better performance, stronger security. I think it's true. I think Basically, it's better to depend on a company that knows security and has experts than depend on your own incomplete knowledge. So uh, another part of the process is having sensors and cameras collecting all our data. And the more and more data means that they're going to do more and more analytics on us and more centralization. It'll be interesting to see what we can do um, to decentralize. That's part of the later part of the talk. And then... Cloud computing depends on reliable high bandwidth networking. You can tend to forget about this if you're in a high bandwidth area. If you have poor coverage in a backward area like Cambridge, Massachusetts, you will not get the kind of service. And now the wireless networks are upgrading to 5G. You've all heard about that. It's part of it certainly hype. There's probably something there. But the whole goal of this is to get us to use the cloud more and more. And the more we depend on these centralized servers, the more we depend on the telecom networks. That's the whole business model. So I'm not going to say any more about those. That's not the focus of the talk. Though so Moore's Law is the first issue. And it's hard to remember that there was a time when we just ran all the calculations we want on our own computers. And if the computer wasn't powerful enough, we went out and bought a bigger computer. But since the mid-2000s, uh, there has been this stop. Uh, they, of course, the chip manufacturers put in multiple cores, but you run into Amdahl's law. You can't paralyze everything. So there has been a kind of slowdown in what we can do with our systems. I'll look at some of the breakthroughs later that might change that. Um, so, uh, there's an interesting transition to the data center. I want to do a little bit of history here. So, supercomputers are putting a lot of chips together using networks to connect, connect those chips. Um, some of these are very proprietary, very expensive, very complicated. And two interesting instances of this from the 1980s are the butterfly. I believe that company was right near here, certainly in Cambridge. And Thinking Machines was moved from Waltham to a place a few blocks from here. Obviously, they failed. And the interesting thing is that there was another model that was also taking place right near here. This model was a flexible architecture, open standards, open software, free software. And this proved to be the path forward. And the example I'm using is Project Athena, right at MIT, 1983. 
So now, if you look at a typical supercomputer, so I went online to find out what's considered the fastest one this year, and when you look at the specs, they're pretty much like a data center, open standards and Linux and so forth. So uh, is this important? I think it's very important because things like um, weather forecasting require a lot of computers. If you do not follow Richard Stallman's advice and you use credit cards, you will be happy to have the fraud detection. Furthermore, we have new types of interfaces. Most people with the mobile devices want a voice interface, whether they're saying turn on the light or something more complicated, like how do you get lunch near the status center? So first of all, you have to go out into the internet to find the data, and then it takes a lot of analytics. And there are going to be more such interfaces. We'll have haptic interfaces and uh, artificial reality, virtual reality, things that capture eye movements. For all these reasons, we're going to need a lot of analytics, and right now they still have to run in the cloud. People also want intelligent agents, which some people find a bit creepy, but I think that a lot of people are going to want them, particularly if, say, we replace home health care aides with robots, which I think we'll need to do soon. Now, another after the Moore's Law, finished with that one, advances in processors, uh, which is often called compiling into hardware. And I'm going to have a little historical digression again. You might remember CISC, Complex Instruction Set Computing. That term was applied in the 70s and 80s to uh, the typical chips. And often the um, most complicated instruction would be several times as expensive as the simplest instruction because you might be adding two numbers, setting a bit, doing a, a jump all in one instruction. So some companies to try to um, simplify, try to find a, an ONAMS razor kind of thing for reduced instruction set computing risk. Uh, you might remember silicon graphics and MIPS and how big they were. Here's a little project you might have fun with. Uh, you can, when you go home or right now if you're bored with this talk, you can go online and find out where the headquarters were of silicon graphics. It had two buildings and they're both very important still in uh, Silicon Valley today. Anyway, it was resolved. The modern chips from Intel are CISC, but they have some of the advances that the risk companies found. And most devices in the world are running ARM chips, and the R in ARM stands for risk. However, CISC still inspires anything that is specialized. Network processors, GPUs, encryption, field programmable, gate arrays. Uh, this is the idea of compiling into hardware. And recently, Google created the Tensor Processing Unit. The Tensor is a um, generalization of the idea of a matrix to multiple dimensions. So it's all over science and all over machine learning. And the Tensor Processing Unit just compiles it into hardware. They figured out how to make the hardware do a matrix multiply really fast. And so um, the centralized data centers really have one up on us now because of things like this. But there will be a surprise. Uh, just this month there was an announcement, which I will come back to. So there is one thing that would end the argument about whether we're moving to the cloud. You might have anticipated it. Quantum computing. We don't really know yet whether it will work. We don't know whether we can get those tiny particles to do what we want. We don't know whether the algorithms will really produce better results than conventional computing, but they claim that they'll be able to break encryption and so forth. Now, here's a typical uh, refrigerator, the type that they use to hold a quantum computing unit. They have to get down to lower than 2 degrees Kelvin, colder than outer space, so don't try to put one of these in your basement. So if the quantum computing revolution really happens, it's over. We're in the cloud, and we'll be getting uh, quantum computing in the cloud. This particular example, quiz kit, comes from IBM, and there are others. So I finished with that point, with the um, moving, uh, compiling into hardware. So we'll talk about collecting data, which is a fairly simple idea. Two correlated data sets are more value than one. For instance, imagine that you uh, get the list of everybody who went to a local political rally, and then you get the list of voters in your area and how good it would be to combine those. I volunteer for political campaigns, and they do this all the time. This is politics today. And if you can do that with two data sets, how about 100, 1,000, a million, 
So this explains both why analytics are seeming to produce magical results nowadays and why it's so addictive. The companies just can't uh, stay away from getting that data and trying to exploit it. Two recent examples. Um, if you go into a uh, package store and get a beer out of the refrigerator, there could be a camera looking at you and trying to figure out your buying habits. If you're on an airplane and turn on the uh, entertainment system in front of you, it has a camera that's tracking your movements. But of course, it's all to improve their service. So data is big. Well, that was the core of the talk, but there's a lot of possible remedies I'd like to talk about. Uh, one, I think, is obvious. A lot of people have considered this, trying to move processing back to our mobile devices. And there's a lot that they can already do. You probably know that Apple has moved face recognition onto the device, and they actually explicitly say this is a privacy-preserving measure. You can do facial recognition on a Raspberry Pi. Another example, 3D scans of objects on your mobile phone. So these are just a few examples of how powerful local devices are. The speech recognition in this final example was kind of limited. It's just recognizing one word, which is pretty far from answering the question, where do I get lunch near the Stata Center? But we're making progress. And the way these things work is dividing labor between the centralized systems and the local systems. So the uh, central hub collects the data. The hub runs machine learning and produces a model. The edge devices download the model. And this is division of labor. Uh, we could improve what devices can do. So a little bit about hardware advances, just a, a quick overview of the field. Directed subassembly, clever way of using the um, properties of certain things like polymers to do the arrangement on the chip in a very precise way. Could lower costs and produce better chips. Gallium nitride is promising. That's the younger cousin of gallium arsenide, which didn't quite live up to its promise. Tunnel field effect transistors are things that um, can be used for low power, low cost processing, maybe good for uh, mobile devices. And ferro electronic FET storage, you can look that up. They may well replace flash cards, SSDs. Spintronics is a very interesting experimental process. We have depended since the beginning of computing on, um, excuse me, on the, whether the electron is positive or negative, it's charge. But if you use the spin, you could be much more efficient, make more efficient devices. I tried to find a video of an electron spinning, but I couldn't find one, so I left that blank. And then DNA could be the ultimate storage for long-term storage. It lasts a long time, as you may know if you've dug up a, a, a mastodon, and it's very, very compact. So these are just a few examples of how we can break through Moore's Law. And now for the surprise I mentioned before, the TPU is now available on an embedded device and a dongle that you could plug in to some other device. And Google is saying they want to promote machine learning on edge devices. I think that's a great idea. Furthermore, we could uh, improve the software. The idea is the hardware would get better and better, making more and more possible, and the software would get more and more effective, efficient, and hopefully have more and more things we can do on these devices. I'll just list a few examples of this because what I want to get aside, uh, across here is that people are making technical advances all the time. There's a lot of creativity out there. Um, so if you work in machine learning, you know about CNNs and RNNs, and you also know that they're being replaced in a lot of cases by more efficient algorithms. Another interesting thing in machine learning is never-ending learning, uh, just like on your mail mailer, when you say that a certain mail thing is spam, it updates, the, the Bayesian filter updates its um, algorithm and is better at filtering. So never ending learning is the same thing in machine learning. You can get stuck at, I guess, what you'd call a local minimum, but it's uh, certainly very effective. And furthermore, we already have a um, uh, model for doing processing in two different ways. The Lambda and the Kappa architectures are saying that they, you have to have two different types of processing that cooperate. One is slower, more batch, and one is streaming in real time. So that's a model, and we could have another model that would um, have the cloud working better 
with local devices. So when we think about the improvements in hardware and software, they will also improve what's running in the centralized systems. So uh, I would suggest that we not try to pursue an arms race between local devices and centralized computing. We should find a way they can work together, but try to empower individuals and protect their privacy more and more in a cloud environment. Furthermore, we can keep local processing really local. Right now, when you tell uh, the Echo, the Amazon Echo, to turn on the lights, the data goes up into the Amazon servers and back and turns on the lights. So this is a man-in-the-middle attack designed right into the architecture, collecting your data. It's also ecologically harmful because networking is expensive. The data centers have learned to be very efficient with energy and so forth. But um, networking is expensive, so usually when you use the cloud, it's more expensive than doing it locally. And finally, you're sending data over the Internet. I'm sure it's encrypted, but still there's a, uh, there's a risk in there, and you're opening up your device. So let's keep local communications local. Here's another thing. Now that we've gotten past the idea of uh, um, working on local devices, more public data could help. Uh, this is an um, uh, initiative a lot of governments have done. They have an open government initiative, which involves opening a lot of data. Uh, they want to um, be more transparent, but they also want to help small companies and nonprofits. And the idea is that even though the big companies will keep collecting more and more data, there will be some data sets out there for the public to use. And that will help businesses, it will help uh, innovation, and help nonprofits to do their uh, missions. However, this data can be abused. We saw that with Sci Group and Cambridge Analytica. So the data should not just be put on the web. There should be some kind of license. You should have to sign something to download it, and somebody should be policing that. And then we can move to distributed services. Many of you have heard of these open source services, Jabber for instant messaging and Riot for um, more like WhatsApp messaging, Diaspora, the uh, social media uh, network. I've been studying this myself since around the year 2000, and I talked a lot in that time about the promise, but also that there were some fundamental difficulties in addressing, coordinating, and trust, which are in the articles that these point to. I think they can be overcome. Everybody has to find a unique way to overcome the problems of distributed services. But they are more complicated than the centralized ones, and that might be one reason they've never gotten to the extent of a Facebook or a Twitter. But with some help, maybe we could have the distributed services more successful and more popular. Um, the idea, of course, is that the distributed services do not collect your data. They leave the data on your device or your browser, whatever, for your protection. But why not have data analytics algorithms that work on distributed services? This is called federated learning. So the idea is that we could voluntarily share our data, hopefully in some form that doesn't reveal too much about ourselves, and it could be aggregated through some distributed algorithm. Uh, I think this could be done. Uh, there's a huge amount of creativity in the field. So when businesses were getting a lot of incoming data from stores, sales from stores, Twitter feeds, all the things they wanted to process, they complained to their um, data scientists and their programmers that they needed new systems, and new systems were developed. So we have a whole new architecture for things like Flink and Storm. And if programmers could do that, I think they could do a lot with distributed systems if they apply themselves to that. And if you happen to follow the federated learning link, you will get to a Google site, which I think is great. The Google's looking into it. But there are many other academic papers and, and uh, research about that. So I'm thinking of particularly differential privacy. This is a system which uh, protects privacy by fudging every query a bit. And if you issue a lot of queries, the queries are fudged just enough so that you can't re-identify someone by combining the data. Uh, it works well over a centralized data set. I'm wondering whether it could work over distributed data too. So uh, distributed services would also be energized by the open data movement that I mentioned earlier. This is uh, my last point. I'm, going to, I'm leaving this for the end because it's 
technical conference and mostly technical talk, but we do have to mention the legal ideas, uh, general data protection regulation, I like it. People have criticized it as being too strict and also as being to uh, having too many loopholes. Uh, there have been some studies showing that in the European Union, the GDPR has caused less innovation, however they measure it. I think if you can't innovate without violating people's privacy, you shouldn't be innovating. So I like the GDPR, at least it's a model. A lot's going on in the United States. Another idea is to pay people. This is built on the idea of uh, protecting their data. They, uh, you would promote business by collecting people's data but paying for it. There are a lot of problems with that. For instance, it uh, legitimizes data collection in the first place. It says, yes, let's collect all this data. Just give people some money. And then there's a lot of data exhaust, where we move, uh, sensors that measure what we're doing, cameras. So there's a lot of stuff that companies can get without even asking our consent. And it creates two-tier privacy because the affluent will protect their health and financial information, and a lot of other people will have to give it up because they need the rewards. So I'm not so sure I like the idea of paying individuals. And consent itself is a problem. Uh, I'm saying this as someone who obsessively reads the terms and services on every website I visit, but even I do not um, reject a web service. I don't think I've ever rejected a web service just because I didn't like the terms and conditions, and most people don't even read them. So I'm going to stop and open things up for discussion. There's a, a microphone here, and I think we also have microphones there. I'll leave you with a few thoughts. Cloud computing presents challenges to those who value freedom, autonomy, and privacy. Uh, we can use both technology and policy changes to address them. And people at this conference, people on the IRC, anyone who can work on these issues, has the skills to work on them and can understand them, should be doing it to carve out safe spaces. And that is it. Uh, thank you. What's your opinion on distributed computing, like with the Ethereum network? Uh, what network? Distributed computing. Yes. Uh, so a whole network, it uses a blockchain to do computing rather than a centralized so server? Well, uh, I'm not sure. But distributed computing is very broad. Blockchain is a very narrow technology. I want to wait and see what it does. But blockchain... Um, I researched this when I was doing that peer-to-peer -peer stuff that I mentioned in an earlier slide. And there are problems with trust. Like just because somebody signed something and put it on the blockchain doesn't mean you know who they are, whether they were vetted by anybody, and so forth. So I think we'll have to uh, solve the trust issues. There'll have to be some central authority saying, yes, this person is really who they say they are. Um, I'm up in the air about blockchain. I think a lot of people are. I'm going to wait and see if it uh, is useful. Does that answer the question? Yes. Okay, thanks. So uh, some of the uh, just emerging hardware technologies you mentioned, like quantum computing or you know, uh, alternative uh, memory storage technologies like Spintronics and DNA, these are hardware, emerging hardware platforms that will require integration into existing classical you know, one Newman architecture. So there has to be some sort of way of interfacing those what would be the role of you know free software like uh, implementing uh, interfaces between these type of new architectures and uh, mm. classical computing that we have this today this might be beyond me could you say okay. that again uh, i had a little trouble with the words as well. uh, so i was just wondering if there's a role for free software to integrate this emerging uh, hardware technologies from, from quantum you know whatever you call it into today's architectures and what is your thought on that um, it's, I think it might be beyond me, but name some of these hardware arch arch architectures you'd like to integrate. Like I said, quantum computing is a new oh, emerging architecture, oh, but it will require a software oh, stack of its own to talk to a classical computer, oh, yeah. like a one Newman architecture, and what would be the role of you know, open source community or free software in that space? And 
Yeah, how do you see that evolving? Yeah, I think free software is definitely useful at all levels when you deal with quantum computing. In the interfaces, in the uh, algorithms themselves, um, there are people working on open source libraries. But my point in the talk is no matter how free, but these are free software, they're going to run on these huge systems in uh, sub, sub 2 degree Kelvin uh, environments. So we're going to have to use somebody else's server unless you have $20 million. But certainly I agree with using free software on them. And I think that the people developing the algorithms would benefit from making them free software, just as we see with all other kinds of software. Is that OK? OK. Hi. Um, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I think, there was an exhibitor here called uh, MadeSafe. There's a company that um, is working on basically um, the next internet almost. Um, they call it the SafeNet. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, I, uh, if you did, that's awesome because it seems like it addresses a lot of these problems, a couple of the problems you're talking about at the same time, which is sort of like taking back the cloud as uh, a sp as something that we own uh, on our own because it does the whole distributed uh, computing thing, but it also does distributed storage. It does distributed uh, general computing resources and, um, and is distributed across the whole internet, basically. So uh, you are able to um, give some resources that you have locally to the, this network, and then you're able to use resources if you want to um, you know, store your photo collection or something like that, and everything's completely encrypted and only able to be uh, seen by you and those who uh, uh, give it access. But um, I was just wondering uh, your thoughts on, you know, if feder federated um, platforms are more of like a stepping stone to something like that, or if uh, it was something you just don't have any opinion on, or. Mm -hmm. I think I know the kind of system you're talking about, and if it's what I'm thinking about, they've been around for at least 20 years. Uh, you, instead of putting the data in some central location, um, you break it up, and it may be stored by the company on its own servers, or people may share each other's computers and store each other's data. But there are complicated algorithms for partitioning it, encrypting it, and then doing it in a redundant way so that if you lose N out of M pieces, you could still put together the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing. Yeah, that's yep. been around. I think that's a great idea. Yep. I'm not sure why it didn't uh, take off. Maybe it's the complexity or uh, mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, okay. I, I think that's very good. And it might do very well together with other kinds of distributed computing. Yes. So I really appreciate that you brought up uh, the trust issue with distributed systems, because it turns out Distributed systems work really well as long as there's no bad actors. Mm -hmm. And so the cloud, uh, cloud company has the advantage of if somebody misbehaves, you can fire them. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot harder in a federated system. Uh, can you talk about, are there any specific projects or efforts or standards on creating like both technical and governance, like higher level architectures for how do you manage identity and trust? That would be great to hear from people on IRC. I don't have anything that comes to mind. I mentioned a few uh, inspirational uh, distributed projects earlier. They're, they're still not uh, very uh, well adopted. If anybody on IRC has an idea, we can hear that. maybe at this conference we should start something. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the talk. One of the uh, things that you mentioned earlier was that there are uh, ways to address you know, these kinds of issues using technology and also by using policy. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you mentioned GDPR is one example of a policy, and I'm aware of, you know, th specialized niches we have, like for dealing with health data or financial data. I'm wondering what, what kind of, uh, if there are any policy ideas that you thought might be, um, you know, useful. This is really, really tough because I said, most things that try to protect your privacy, or either they, did, they shut it all down, don't collect, or, or you know, don't use it a certain way, uh, which may sometimes be necessary, or they rely on consent. 
And there's so many problems with consent. I think you can uh, look that up on your own. So I, I don't want to go too much in that. Uh, consent is sort of an important concept, just like free will is an important concept. And as I said earlier, a lot of what distributed computing is doing is kind of challenging our notion of human free will, and I think it's also challenging our notion of consent. I don't have a simple answer, but certainly there are a lot of people trying to work on it. Uh, I like the this one. Um, I like the idea of um, you know a push for keeping how do you put it keeping local data local or something like that like don't send your thermostat data out to you know the cloud when you just need to talk to your furnace. Um, is there any way like how do you see that something that being something that that could be a trend is that is there like a regulatory possibility for that probably not some sort of certification I don't know. Well, I guess you've given me the chance, since we're at the end, you've given me the chance to make um, two points in summary. The first point is currently we have to work with central systems. We have a, a division of labor between the cloud and the local device, and we've got to adopt that. But in the future, we can hope to have distributed systems do everything that centralized systems do. Um, it's, a, it's a goal to go for, and we should put that out there as a challenge for the computing community. All the great things you've done in centralized systems, streaming data, can you do those in a distributed way? Well, thank you. Oh, is there time? Uh, yeah, we have a time. Okay. So maybe I'll make another summary. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to make you summary. Okay. So I, um, and I'm almost reluctant to ask you a question about 5G since nobody really knows, but they've been talking a lot about putting more like compute resources near the edge of the networks, and that's something that's on the minds of a lot of the people talking about 5G, from my understanding, especially with a lot of the Internet of Things devices and stuff like that. So when we talk about cloud, and I, I know it's a bad term, but when we talk about cloud, you know, historically it's been a big server or a bunch of servers across the globe somewhere, and now maybe it's going to be more, you know, a swarm of devices nearby, potentially, to your point, more local. I'm curious how you feel about that. Like, it might be keeping your data closer to you locally, but it's still out of your control because it's going off to, like, some ISP data server on the antenna or something. It sounds like an architectural detail. Um, if you don't change the rules about collection, ownership, and so forth, or you don't change the technology that determines ownership, then I don't think it um, makes a difference in terms of privacy, autonomy, and so forth. So uh, kind of on that note, I think that the policy end of it is actually more effective than techno technological solutions that are just playing whack-a-mole. I think it's ridiculous that data can be such a huge source of value for these companies, yet when there's a data breach and you know millions of people's data is exposed, there's no consequences for that in most cases because it's hard to prove uh, actual harm from the release of that data. So I think one of the most important things for accomplishing this is turning data into a liability rather than an asset for these companies and having actual consequences when these kinds of things happen. So if they are going to hold the data, they need to protect it in good faith. And, and they might think twice about collecting the data in the first place if there's consequences if something happens to it. Uh, what are your yeah, I like that idea. Certainly, we should be stricter about punishing, you know, when Facebook uh, puts out, uh, or they didn't put out the passwords, but they let their employees get the passwords or something like that. And we could maybe increase a hundredfold or more the penalties. Uh, but we should remember, and this is why people who deal with data science and algorithms have a dilemma. We don't want to destroy privacy, but there's a lot of good things you can do with data. We can improve health care, you know, uh, maybe deal with climate change. So it's very hard to say shut it down, but I think we should uh, enforce rules that companies be more responsible, in both in their own use and in breaches. <laughs>
Uh, so one other question I would have is uh, kind of the roles of uh, mergers and acquisitions when we are starting to talk about data mm -hmm. that is now in the cloud and some of the trends that we might see if, uh, as companies are gobbling up other companies that have these data centers and that consolidation. Do you have, uh, is that, do you see that as a concern or do you have any comments or thoughts on that or uh, as these mergers and acquisitions happen, are there policy changes that need to impact uh, or, or that could help improve some of the, that centralization that happens? I think you should ask an economist that. As I understand it, doing you know, some general reading, some people think that you should prevent uh, a lot, you should prevent monopolies, and we have laws against it. And what Warren is saying is that if you have the platform, you shouldn't be allowed to use the platform because then you're competing with the people using your platform. That's a very common argument, and that's throughout economics. It's not just with computing. So uh, that's very common. And other people say, oh, there'll be, there'll be a, a, um, another competitor. You know, remember when Yahoo was the big thing, or remember when Microsoft was really big, and it still is. I mean, it, it was recently the biggest company in the world. But, um, so there are different opinions on that. I tend to worry about monopolization and concentration. I do. Yeah. Thank you all very much, and thank you. Thank you.